Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Well, for our audience, we have been together for a number of podcasts, but truly, when we go behind the scenes, the fact is we're together for the first time for the fall. So, Rachel, (laughs) it is such a delight to be with you again, even though, frankly, we've been together a hundred other times in a hundred other places, but just not the podcast. So, how are you? What we're going to do today is a state of, I don't know. The Union, State of the Union. How are you? How are, how am I? How are we? How is the world uh, as we launch into more of our fall? How are you? Yeah. Well, I mean, what that I feel like these days that question it's almost like you have Loaded. to ask it with like such fear and trepidation, um, and almost like a um, like a permission slip, like is it okay for me to ask you how you are? Um, like how triggering will that be at such a time as this? Um, but I, I will say I, today is the first day of fall, the autumnal equinox the uh, actually happened this morning. Um, and there is something for me, this is typically my favorite time of year. Um, mm-hmm. I'm coming up on my first year wedding anniversary. Um, I love the weather this time of year. Typically, I love the way the sun shines, the way the air feels. And yet, I have to say today, I'm probably the most ambivalent about the fall I've ever been. Obviously, it is still a really hard season, a really, really hard season for multiple factors, continued just ongoing unfolding of this global pandemic that I think all of us are feeling this sense of like, oh, this isn't going away. School has started in some of the most unprecedented ways. Our kids are at home learning virtually. Racial injustice just continues to be amplified and further like exposed, and I would say amplified in our country. And we're moving toward a very, um, I would say, volatile And again, exposing the division in our country, the polarization election uh, in November. So I am, I am, you know, I feel like my kind of rote answer for people these days is despite all the things, I have to say, I am well. And in the same breath, there's also a sense of like, and I feel despair knocking on the door, and I'm overwhelmed, and I'm scared, and I'm fragmented, and And I'm well, and there's a lot to be grateful for, um, a lot to anticipate, and a lot to celebrate. And both like this kind of epicenter of where joy and sorrow just take up such residence in the same body just feels, thank you, Marie Oliver, for those words, um, just feels very prevalent and pervasive. How about you, Dan? Well, could I just, uh, uh, will you let me go by by just going, uh, Ditto, baby. <laughs> like, I'm crazy. I, I think I'm... I, have you ever heard the phrase, crazy as a loon? Yeah. And I don't even know. I mean, I've, I've heard loons on Wisconsin, you know, back in the woods lakes, and they're haunting. Uh, you know, it's, so I, I think in that sense, I feel crazy well, uh, disturbed deeply by the world, my... my son, daughter-in-law, and two grandchildren are moving into my office tomorrow, Mm -hmm. so I lose my space maybe for two weeks, maybe for months, uh, because they're in the middle of selling their home, looking for another home that will fit them better, but they have no place to go, and I love them, and it would be fabulous and difficult if it weren't in the middle of COVID, but trying to figure out how to live mm-hmm. with this we, i mean just bottom line you said it so well we are at war we are polarized certainly as a culture and that demand to choose sides to blame to excoriate somebody else you can't help but be caught up if you even look at the news depending on what you read uh, you are 
you were just being constantly drawn to um, distance, uh, to attack, to blame. Uh, I, I think as a world, we're not well. So, to be even moderately well in a world that's not well with so many friends who are really not well, um, it, it, it's both that sense of privilege that certainly is undeserved, but on the other hand, deeply appreciated that we are physically well at this point. Um, you know, I, I, we're living in a world where it, there's just no one to trust. Um, all the illusions that this party, that party, this person, this this politician, this, this, that, is trustworthy. Um, we're living in such a world of skepticism that it's hard to actually find any rest. Um, so, I, I think, do you see how scattered I am? Hmm. I mean, I, I feel, even as the question comes, fragmented. So, what's the state of the union? Traumatized, fragmented, numb, isolated, the things we talk about almost to a point of ad nauseum. We are in a world, and I find myself at times just literally not being able to find a word. And that could be age, but it's also, I think we're living in a traumatized era. Well, I mean, you and I talked about this, like I have been very concerned, like if I need to actually kind of do some investigating of my body and my brain, because I'm really struggling to find words in this season and not like, you know, my, I read a bunch of books, educated words, which I always struggle to find because I talk so fast, but also like just I'm trying to describe something I need my husband to grab from downstairs. And I just keep saying the thing with the things and the thing. And the thing, and I'm trying, I can see it, and I'm trying to bridge the gap to find the words for it. And it's literally like they're just not there. And it, and I think, you know, I know enough about trauma to know that's so revelatory of where I'm at and where we're at, I think, collectively um, at this time. I mean, it's hard even to be, there's something about the summer months, um, you know, regardless of where people stand on the politicization of COVID, like people are still dying. Um, people are still getting sick and we're moving into a season where we've been able to be outdoors and that brought kind of a, you know, we know enough about how this virus works that we, we know it was safer to be outside. Um, and so we haven't actually had to face a season, a long season yet with COVID where we're mostly indoors. Um, and I feel that kind of that turn. And I, I even feel like, I just think you, you name, like we're in a, like a, a skeptical time. And I would say we're in a time with a lot of scarcity and terror as well. Mm-hmm. Um, ongoing terror and just a pervasive sense of scarcity. I mean, <laughs> I told you about, I told Dan about this and I'll just share this with all of you. Um, at the beginning of COVID, you know, my scarcity structure is really kicked up and the, the paper towel situation, you know, just, I, I don't know what it was about paper towels that just made me like, I could almost deal with no toilet paper. There was something about paper towels and how much I cleaned. <laughs> there was just like, I can't do this. Okay. Okay. Just let me say sideways. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> and so, you know, I was scrolling on Instagram and, um, this ad came up like 18 rolls of toilet paper. I mean, uh, paper towels. And I, you know, in a moment of insanity, which I do feel like just is really fair right now, I purchased the $65 worth of 18 rolls of paper towels. After the purchase, realized I bought them from Hong Kong. That was a great moment. Um, and I watched the, the, you know, the mail go move through China Post, come to the U.S. Postal Service. So, I'm like, it's coming. It's just taking a long time. My bank called me to be like, hey, just so you know, we think there's a fraudulent charge. I was like, no, I just, you know, panic bought some paper towels from Hong Kong. It's fine. And I'm going to, when they come, it's like, it's going to be great. And, you know, in the mean, in the two and a half months of meantime, I found paper towels at the store. It was fine. <laughs> However... <laughs> I'm like telling my husband, they're going to come. It's just, you know, it's just taking a long time. The mail finally arrives from uh, Hong Kong and it's a envelope with a tiny, 
tiny roll of toilet paper that they definitely just put in the mail. So I'd follow this tracking number for two months and give them my $65. <laughs> so I mean, you know, the scarcity <laughs> is real. I'm sorry. I, I, I should not. I'm not mocking the, the struggle. But do you, do you still have those? Uh, those roles? You know, I sh- wish I would have kept it, but honestly, I was so angry and I felt so much shame. I felt so much Of course much you felt shame, shame. That I just, I threw it away. Like, I don't want anyone to know. Did, that, you didn't take you a know, photo? I, Because you know, I'd love for you to post that on Instagram. <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of try to, I scrolled through to try to find it and I know I did because it literally was like the size of my hand. Um, I'm sure they probably just like, grabbed it out of some public restroom and put it in an envelope and, and sent it to my address. But, you know, th- there's just an absurdity and an insanity to this moment. And, and yet, though I feel invited to despair, I do not feel without hope. But I think back to your question of uh, where, where, where is our hope these days? And what are we realizing even, you know, with the Allender Center, we've spent the summer transitioning all of our programs to a virtual format that I think we're really proud of. And, and we've put a lot of work into, um, and even that kind of that hustle as we kind of are now immersing, we'll launch our, our, our NFTC level one certificate this week with over 120 participants. So, you know, we're off and rolling and we've been in our own leadership development. We've been in our own learning process. Um, you know, how do you think that the kind of this overwhelming, in some ways, we're at war, we are not well, and we're well, like, how would you say that's manifesting in the Allender Center and our work together? Well, we have been, as you put it, so well, so productive. I mean, the transition of our team and uh, the work behind the scenes by uh, Rebecca and Alicia and Melissa and others to get us online. We've, we have, we have reached pinnacles of, of hard labor bringing good about that I'm, as you put it, I'm proud, just so proud of all of our labor. But I, here are the next thing. It, it's productivity, but it's in the midst of war. There is no peace right now. And maybe there won't be, maybe it was an illusion there was peace before, but it's, it's not peaceful. So, we put together a, I think, stunning online course for marriage, and we're putting out date nights and uh, a conference, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm proud of our labor, really proud of our labor, and it's excellent, but it's in the midst of feeling nuts. Um, and so, I, I bless having to work very hard because at times it's done the same thing that a glass of wine or two will do. It, it almost allows me to numb, but it's when I come back to my senses that I realize I, I'm, I'm insensible. I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy. I'm not traveling. I'm not well. I, I don't know what's happening in my world. And again, the sense of, in conversations, even with dear friends, I find myself having to choose political sides, having to, in one sense, like, I'll say a dear acquaintance asked me about QAnon, and I just said, I, I, I've never heard anything more stunningly ridiculous that some dude by the name of Q is passing out information about human trafficking being run by Democrats and Hollywood stars. And you go, are we at a point of such freaking madness that the most ridiculous of conspiracy theories are circulating as if in certain communities, as if it's true. You know, I've been involved in, in addressing human trafficking for two decades, and I have friends who are so deep in doing the work that when they hear about this, they're, and these are mostly overseas people, who are going, what's going on in America? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you go, well, it's the best of times. And I, I, I really mean that. It is the best of times if this is a period where you want to be conformed um, to the image of Jesus. Uh, I mean, our world's collapsing. It's mm-hmm. fragmenting. Mm-hmm. It's numb. It's in strange mm-hmm. tribal isolation. We are a traumatized culture. And 
I keep coming back to how much do I really want Jesus? And the answer is a lot of times, not much. Mm-hmm. I want I want the perception of the illusion of the old world that I thought was working a lot better than it is. And yet, when our dear friends, uh, particularly of color, who are saying, this is the world we've been living in, and you're just discovering it. Um, you're just owning up in some ways to the level of privilege, to your own issues of fragility, to the cruelties that we've known both systemically and individually. Like, welcome, welcome to the real world. And I find something in me awakening, uh, heartbroken, but awakening to, okay, you know, before I pass from this earth, it's better to face reality than not. And that's what I keep coming back to. I believe the truth can be found, but it is hard labor to come to that with regard to whether it's a New York Times or a Wall Street Journal article dealing with the same issue. It's hard to find the truth, but the truth is personal. The the truth is Jesus. And you got to ask, and you got to seek and knock. And if you don't do so with an openness to, in one sense, all sides, uh, to hear, to truly hear, then uh, you're going to be blindsided by the tribalism and the division and the polarization. So, I'm going, okay, I need to step into so many more. I mean, I need to rethink my economic theory. I need to rethink my political theory. I need to, yeah. I need to think through my white privilege at new levels. Yeah. So I, I've, I actually find this to be uh, an exciting and redemptive possibility. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when you're saying that, I, I feel like in this season, so much I've been hearing uh, as I've been reflecting on. I think in some ways, not like that my faith has not been real because I would I would say 100% my faith in Jesus my understanding of the gospel has been real but seeing different stories in the text and hearing them very differently in this season hearing an invitation from the spirit very differently and I think about the rich young ruler and you know Jesus saying if you want to enter the kingdom of God go and sell everything you own and come and I think it's easy to hear that as someone who grew up in a trailer park <laughs> for a season and be like, okay, um, that's for someone else. Um, but to think about riches and wealth and and that sense of like, it'll be harder <laughs> for, you know, a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. And I think I'm hearing that in different ways. Like, what will my faith look like if some of the privileges I've been exposed to living in this nation in the skin and body that I'm in um, need to be dismantled? And well, I still say, praise Jesus, you're amazing. And I think um, I think you're right, Dan, that sense of um, no one side of any polarity is going to be reflective of the gospel. That doesn't mean um, that we escape or we live in denial or we choose not to participate, but it certainly means that we are looking for the fruit of the Spirit. Um, with the people we are discipled by, the people we learn from, and the people we're learning with. And I I feel like at this particular moment in time, um, I am desperate to hear from Jesus, and I am desperate to understand how the people I love and trust, who maybe are very different from me, how they see and hear from Jesus, and to ask these questions together. And to really take stock of what is my faith in? I mean, you know, there's so many parables in the text that are just feel very pervasive. You know, have I built my house on sinking sand or have I built my house on the solid rock? And what is that solid rock? Because I think uh, in our culture, so much of what we have thought and have named as solid rock, we're seeing crumble before our very eyes. Yes, and, and rightfully. A, yeah, and there's a lot of people saying, this is God's judgment, or this is this, and I just think, or, you know, yeah, it's painful, and death and destruction are real, so I'm never going to spiritualize something, but it is where I'm saying, Jesus, what 
do you have for us? What are you needing us to see? What is the way we're meant to follow? What is the repentance we're meant to participate in? And where is the new life of the Spirit breaking out in places that if we were in the days of Jesus, because so many of us are from, in some ways, that religiosity that's been married to um, empire, where would we be going, there's no way, Jesus, it would be speaking or showing up there, because come on, where's the uh, authorization, where's the vetting, where's the like, and I just, so, I hear you in that, like I say exciting, not with a sense of entitlement or thrill or um, frivolity, but with a deep sense of sobriety. And I think you and I, we've talked about this so much, like the state of the union, this is a time for like the sobriety of the spirit to keep our faces close to the dirt, close to the dirt and not in a um, humiliating way, uh, in that way of like uh, kind of desperate for Jesus and to be close to the true Jesus. Um, that we we get close to the dirt. Well, and that sobriety, and even the word itself. Like I'm, I for five months, I I've consumed more wine than I have in probably the last decade, and that doesn't mean I'm drinking. I mean, I didn't drink at all before, and now right. I'm having a glass of wine a night, and it's not a big deal, but it's symbol. It's a yeah. symbol, and I'm not freaking out. I'm not saying to others, don't do that, but just I'm just looking at something as simple as my sugar intake uh, is, is, is over the edge, and I'm not eating as well. I'm not doing things that bear a sense of futurity and goodness in certain areas. So, I think part of looking at how we are is to also say, there's, there are people uh, around us and even in our own lives where we're doing well in certain areas and not so well yeah. in other areas. And to sort of be able to take a step back and to be able to go, I know I'm saying it again, so I'm warning. This is a trigger warning for everyone out there. We're living in a traumatized era, and it's not going to be elegant at any level. But then don't allow your own or my heart to then say, oh, well, that's fine. Just get through it. Just survive. This is a transformative period. I mean, what we've seen in the Allender Center in terms of, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this at a, a later point, but we've reorganized, mm -hmm. radical reorganization, and it was labor to the nth degree, and it's really good. Yeah. Um, you know, Kathy and I have written a book. Uh, we're still in the middle, but almost toward the end. We created these courses. We've done good work, but good work is never enough. If indeed your own heart is not being transformed. So, when you went back to that word repentance, I think that's one of the things that I've heard Jesus say to me many times now. You know, it, it's time to return to the log in your mm -hmm. own eye, mm -hmm. uh, in relationships, in friendships, in your marriage. You know, it's, it's, it's not destitute. It's not, I'm a wicked man and it's now just time to own up to it. It's like, gosh. Let's get some greater clarity in a world that feels like it's even more obscurely confused with conspiracy theories evolving, it feels like, daily. Yeah. And then to go, oh, no, no, no. Step back, ask, seek, knock. Don't let that pattern be lost. But also, start with the humility of your own bias, Dan, is going to keep you from actually being able to hear well a, a perspective that you don't agree with at all. But but you can learn. So, that, that very thing of what I'm wanting for the country, I've got to begin with the obvious person, me. Hmm. Uh, and that ownership of humility. I don't want to be in a conversation where when I differ with someone, that the primary presence is judgment, contempt, or disdain because you hold to this other view. So, I, I, uh, the recent death of Ginsburg and her relationship with, uh, I always mispronounce his name, Scalia, right? 
Yeah, I think so. Oh gosh, I, 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 I wish somebody did a full documentary just on mm-hmm. their relationship because to have such clearly radical different views, but a level of care, regard, and play between the two of them, um, uh, it. It's a model for what I believe our, our world is meant to have. Uh, but I've got to begin. I got to begin with me. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I've been really trying to be honest about the difference between someone bringing judgment and destruction and someone bringing discomfort. And we also have this prophetic witness in the text where the prophets are speaking in ways that are bringing. Like they are alluding to the judgment of God, but always with an invitation to choose the life and identity we're most meant for, to be those who are blessed to be a blessing, and who are pursuing a vision of what shalom means that moves beyond the personal and me and mine and a world of scarcity to one of abundance, which will always feel alien in this world. It will never quite will never be capable of it using the tools of this world. And yet this is the life we're called to live. We're called to live in this context. And so I find myself returning again to this practice of lament and this groaning of the Spirit that is an active part of prayer as well. As much as Thanksgiving, which is a part of my prayer life, as much as celebration, um, you know, I always say like the, the image of maturity, spiritual maturity we're given in the text is that we would be people who gr- grieve with those who grieve and rejoice with those who rejoice who stand at that intersection of justice and mercy. And I think for me, that's where some of this polarization feels, it it starts to break down. um, Because we are meant to be people who hold tension and live into the tension of the kingdom of God without apology. And so, I, I am... I am letting my body and heart and mind like join a flow of the Spirit that I think makes a lot of sense to me. A groaning, a crying out, um, a wondering of how long, oh Lord, like how long? And like you said, trying to take stock of where um, where trauma gets manifested for me and I move toward fight, flight, or freeze. Um, because I think trauma is the enemy of the God. The impact of trauma is the enemy of the gospel, which is why I think <laughs> evil loves to feed off of trauma and loves to keep us in cycles of trauma. Because the reality is, if we are bound to the impact of our trauma, we will continue to traumatize other people. And ourselves. Exactly. And ourselves. It's a vicious cycle. That frame of being able to go, look, when you feel discomforted because a different political, a different theological, a different biblical view is being presented, can you have a heart that says, no, truth can be found, but it will not be found quickly? Or easily. Yeah, you're not going to find truth on Fox News or on CNN. You, you'll find truths, but not the truth. So, you got to ask and you got to seek and knock, particularly in places that make you uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. Uh, and if we can't bear discomfort, particularly in this season, we're going to ba- go back and reside in the black and white of, of, of polarization, the blaming and justification, or uh, the relenting to conspiracy theories because they confirm that the world is as crazy as we are. So, when we begin to do the work of looking at the log in our own eye, I actually think it gives us almost a sense of rest to say, no, we're not being blamed when we look at the log in our own eye. We're simply saying, I'm responsible to make this particular crazy period something that I'll look back on two, five, ten years from now and say, there was something about the presence of God in this period, and my heart is different. And my place in this kingdom is different because I've been moved by lament. I've been moved to grieve, to fight, but not to join cruelty, judgment, contempt, disdain in a way that relieves, at least momentarily, 
that sense of trauma. When we turn to violence, it actually for a moment seems to help us step away from the trauma that we're experiencing. But as you put it so well, it increases others' trauma and our own. Mm-hmm. Well, my dear friend and colleague, we're back. And we, we are, are back. back. <laughs> and uh, uh, our hope would be that somehow naming our State of the Union uh, allows you to begin to name yours. Uh, and as we move into the fall with children uh, going to school or not going to school or hybridly doing something like mm-hmm. playing TikTok while they should be in school, um, the bottom line is this is a crazy period. Who do we want to become? How do we want to live? Uh, those are the questions that I think will propel us to enter into truly what I think we all know is an even darker season this fall than what we've had even in spring and summer. So, mm-hmm. it is good to be with you, Rachel Likewise. Clinton Chen, <laughs> as we engage these matters. Indeed. We hope this episode has been helpful. And if you would like to engage your marriage in other ways than this podcast, we'd love to be an ally with you. And one of the ways we're doing so is inviting you to a marriage conference that Kathy Lurzell and I will be teaching on October 10th. It's to awaken your heart to the longings that existed in your relationship and are meant to grow through your relationship. And also, there's a marriage online course that launches October 13th. I'm just so proud of you and the team and all the work that went into this course. We'll help you discover how your personal stories shape your marriage story and find hopeful pathways forward, meaning to become even more intimate and more loving and kinder to yourself and to your spouse, and therefore to your marriage. And finally, we've got date nights, which I I don't know if we've ever actually ever had a date night, but we are part of a date night series where we're going to invite couples to an experience of reflection on their marriage in a more playful and engaging way, where you get to celebrate your relationship in greater gratitude and play. And look, all of these can be purchased separately, or you can bundle them together and get the conference for free. So go to the allendercenter.org slash marriage to find out more about all three of these offerings. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Oh,